the best thing is I make a very quick revision of what we've done yesterday. And uh, we can take it from there. I think uh, <clears throat> the key thing we've done uh, yesterday is that uh, uh, we've looked at the various steps in performing a systematic review. So we frame questions, step number one. We search the literature and identify the relevant papers. That's step number two. Then we have a systematic strategy to extract data. And extraction of the data involves extracting data concerning study quality. And um, once we have the data extracted, we can think about whether we need to perform a meta analysis. And once we know about the need to perform a meta-analysis uh, and have all the information in front of us, we can use that information to make sensible judgments about what's the value of the information. So these are the various steps of systematic review. We also looked at the various relationships between the clinical process and the knowledge requirements. So for the first part, we have etiological research, then we have diagnostic research, then we have prognostic or therapeutic research. And we said that each one of these can be assessed either by collecting data directly from patients in which we can call this primary research. And then this primary research can be put together into a systematic review. The data in this case comes from published papers. And for each type of research, whether primary or secondary, we can construct questions using this format where we imagine what are our population's in interventions and exposures and outcomes. So today we will look at a bit more detail about therapeutic research in addition to systematic review. So then we went through a process of framing questions, discovering how questions can be used to write titles, and how a search strategy can be constructed. So at this stage, I think we can just come back to our task for yesterday. So I'll put that up on our slide. And I'll also put in front of me the chat format. So at this stage, I can take any questions that cover the topic from yesterday, as well as any, as, as well as from anybody who wishes to discuss their question or experience with search or framing of the objective. So uh, why did my video disappear? Oh, it should come back again now. So I, it's, it's over to you. We'll spend a little bit of time having a discussion, and then we can proceed to the next phase of uh, our, our of my presentation and uh, the further steps in systematic review and a randomized trial today.
Well, did anybody make an attempt to write their objective based on their question? Uh, hello, Maya here. I did it, but I just need a minute because I'm still in my car. <laughs> I'll be done briefly. Okay, so let's go through your question first. Uh, is, is that um, who, who was speaking just now? Can I? Can you just identify yourself? I can't hear you. I cannot understand why that's the case. Okay. Who, who was speaking just now? Ah, Masha. Please, can you uh, uh, can, can you um, can you explain your question one more time so the colleagues listening can follow where we are and then figure out how to write the objective statement. I can't hear you. Maja, just a minute. You are uh, your connection is bad. Okay. In in the meantime, perhaps somebody else would like. Okay, so um, Rella has uh, has written her objective statement. I just increase the size of the chat. Can you see the chat as well? I guess I better put on my glasses so I can see what is written. Okay, <clears throat> so if we monitor well, investigate genes. Two groups of participants. Patients and healthy women. Will it be co ah, this is your question. Well, what will be the outcome? What's the purpose of the monitoring? Mirala. Okay, it's easier okay. to talk, not to write. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm not sure because in your book, uh, um, in examples of cohort and case studies, everything is about interventions, okay? And uh, I'm just uh, uh, looking for because you have um, uh, boy women like uh, premature or with a uh, premature ovarian in, uh, uh, in uh, sufficient. Uh, so they are like ill women. We are looking, um, uh, putting in, uh, them in that group of uh, 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 um, uh, participants. But okay. I'm not sure because we are not uh, uh, gave, uh, giving them uh, no, uh, no interventions. Okay, but uh, we are just monitoring. Okay, something that they have or not have. Okay, so I'm not sure uh, if we uh, are going uh, from uh, outcomes to uh, to um, uh, because there is no exposure to uh, monitoring genes or in cohort study we divide first uh, those two groups of women and then uh, monitor uh, if uh, outcome is present or absent okay so let's um, let's see what is the So when if you are monitoring people, then you are going forward in time. That is correct. Yes. OK. <clears throat> so this automatically makes it a cohort study, right? OK. <clears throat> so this automatically makes it a cohort study. What is this? What is measurement at the starting point? Uh, I'm taking. Uh... Uh, I picked uh, uh, the genes I uh, want to monitor, okay, a uh, few of them, and then uh, uh, I want to see uh, uh, if uh, they have mutation, okay, if there is more mutations in a boy uh, group than in a group of healthy women. 
Okay, just wait a moment now. So you are thinking that over a period of time, the genes will mutate? No, they're or mutated or not already. Okay. So this is your exposure. Can you see that people with mutation or people without mutation are the two definition or two groups inside your cohort that you are following? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, okay. So in this case, your exposure is inside the body, not outside, for example, by smoking. Okay. Or outside by, for example, taking medication. Okay. Uh, exposure is internal to the body. And you can say that those who have mutation are exposed, those who don't have mutation are not exposed, right? Okay. And then what do you intend to measure when you follow them up? Uh, I to I intend to measure to see if there is mutation or not. Okay. Well, then in that case, you are not really following them up because the purpose of follow up is to see if something changes over time. Ah, okay. So you think? Okay. Okay. I see it. So yours may be a cross sectional study mm -hmm. where you have taken people with particular characteristics. Okay. One group of people have a particular diagnosis. You call them patients. Okay. Another group of people are healthy. Okay. They don't have this diagnosis, and you simply want to hear the rate of of gene mutation in the two groups. Okay. Is am, am I right about that? Yes. Yes. Very right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, okay. okay. So this is not a case control study. This is not a cohort study. This is like a cross-sectional study mm -hmm. uh, where you measure at the same time in a, in a defined group of people, what is their rate of gene mutation? Yes, the rate. Okay. Right. Okay. So thank you then, very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Jaka, you asked a question about whether you need an intervention for a cohort study. There is no. Hopefully, my explanation to Marie Mirella made clear that uh, that exposure does not need to be an intervention in the form of a medication or a surgery. Exposure can be many things, including changes internal to the body, uh, um, and. and uh, answer. You have uh, a question. Participants are people with pulmonary hypertension, uh, with hyperuricemia, therapies for intervention or exposure is allopurinol. Comparison. Well, the comparison will need to be something like a different therapy or placebo or therapy or standard care the outcome can be whether mean pulmonary artery pressure or endothelial dysfunction occurs more often or less often um, Uh, with allopurinol or without allopurinol. Does that make sense? Answer? If you wish, you can also unmute your microphone. Okay, right. So what you wrote as comparison is in fact your outcome. Your comparison will be defined by something other than allopurinol. Right, uh, Marisha, we now look at your uh, question. Participants are people with this condition you described there. And then intervention is bariatric surgery. Well, the comparison would need to be something without surgery. Right? Marisha, can you address my point?
or are your patients all of those who have had bariatric surgery? Or are your participants or population, as you call it, all those who have had bariatric surgery? Are you still there, uh, Marisha? Ah, okay, so now you can see that what you described previously as intervention is in fact your participants. Then I presume your interventions or exposures are different genetic variants. So you could say you have various exposures as defined by genetic variants. And the outcome is change in prognosis over time as defined by liver biopsy, lipid markers, or change in body mass index. D does that make sense, uh, Marija? OK, very good. I think I can now move on to the question by Massa. Comparison of tissue-based uh, versus combination of tissue liquid-based uh, biopsy. So participants are people with this lung cancer. So what are you trying to achieve here? You simply wish to describe the rate of mutation in people with different types of non-small cell lung cancer. Is that the idea, Masa? OK, so in that case, yours is also like a cross-sectional study. You are not really following people up, or are you? You're not trying to figure out whether survival is different or not different amongst people with lung cancer, is correct? Okay, so you are simply going to describe the, so it's like a cross-sectional study. You will describe the mutation rate in various groups as defined by different definitions for exposure, respect to measurements concerning mutation. All right, we now um, is there is there a question that I have missed? Or have I covered all the questions put to me so far? I'm here now with a better connection, Maya here. Yeah, please go ahead, Maya. So uh, our, my question is does percutaneous closure of patent for Amenovale form a long-term, uh, more than 90% functional barrier. So the population are exactly 250 patients after the PFO closure due to an embolic event. And our intervention is that we follow them with contrast echocardiography. And we want to cut of bubbles that are passing from the right to left atrial uh, between the, the device that we put in and the follow-up uh, follow is from one to ten years. And then I also wrote it down. The exposures are the people with the closed PFO and all the people that haven't got the closed one yet. And we are looking for embolic events after the closure because we know that before the closure there are TIAs and um, CVIs and so on. And the outcomes are that the people that had the closure has a, a functional barrier and there are the bubbles that are passing are five or less and that there was no embolic events after the procedure, so uh, six uh, months. Uh, uh, one second, look. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. You're describing the problem extremely well, but I'm unsure whether you are using the terms interventions and ex and out exposures or outcomes correctly. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would like to discuss. Okay. And hopefully clarify. Yes. 
Yes. So you are saying when you follow people up, you are looking for embolic events. <laughs> Just a moment. My daughter is so worried. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, is you still there? Have we lost Maya, looks like. Okay, in that case, what we will do is we will come back to take Maya's... Uh, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Everything's fine. <laughs> So yeah, the participants. Well, well, yeah, first of all, let's start with outcomes. You called, you told mm -hmm. me that you will follow people up to see whether they get embolic events in the future. Yeah, clinical, and then um, with the echocardiography, we're going to count the bubbles and see if there's any passing. Okay, so just one second. Um, so if the bubbles pass, is that an embolic event? We're going to correlate that. If there's more than five bubbles and an embolic event. So what are you trying to establish that? You want to know whether the number of bubbles that pass uh, correlate with the future development of an embolic event that has a clinical manifestation. Yes. All right. Now, from what I can see, your uh, participants are people who will be subjected to this test. Mm -hmm. The the echo. The Just echo test. What is this test? I don't know what this short form is. So you mean the contrast echocardiography? Okay. So the we contrast echocardiography is your intervention. Is that correct? Yes. And what is the comparison? The people that come to us with an embolic event and no closure of the patent for Amenovale. Well, how can this be comparison? You just described to me that this is the population. The population are people who don't have or, or who have patent for Amenovale, right? Yes, but closed. One group is closed and one is still open. Okay, how do you determine who's closed, who's open? They, the people that have the patent for Amenovale and uh, the embolic event, they, they come to the doctor. If they just have the patent for Amenovale, they don't, they don't know. So we get the patients due to the embolic event. So the people who are ill are admitted to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you identify the people who are not ill? We can't. How? It, we, we could if we took people from their homes and we were looking for the patent for Amenovales in asymptomatic people. So you mean you might advertise it on social media yeah. if I pick it up and I can volunteer? Yeah. And then why would I agree to get this contrast cardio, uh, contrast studies that you are talking about? Because it's harmless <laughs> and it's good what, for science. What, what do you mean it is harmless? How, how is this test done? Because this is a um, typical transthoracic echo, not transesophageal. It's uh, normal. You just put some uh, contrast in your, in your vein and then you so see Why it. would I agree? I am completely normal. Why would I agree to let you get inside my vein? So you can do something better for our was population. <laughs> well, well I, I, I wouldn't want to do it. Maybe someone else would. <laughs> okay. So you can already see that a problem can develop. The people who volunteer mm -hmm. to be in the control group may be quite different in ways other than just the presence or absence of patent for a man of valley. Mm -hmm. That's true, yes. So their age may be different, their gender may be different, their economic status or education status might be different. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, and Sarah has just asked, asked a question which I believe is directed to you. She yes, says yes. you need to perform 
transesophageal echography to see it. Can you see those comments made? Yeah, that, that was in the past the main method, but now it now the last year it's okay if you did the contrast with the transthoracic. Okay, so look at this stage. I and uh, Nina, you are also making some comments. That's a different question, I presume. Mm -hmm. So look, I'm going to Masha. I'm just going to summarize. Uh, yes, please. I believe you will have two different groups of people who you would have identified one through presentation in hospital, other through an advertisement to invite healthy volunteers. And you will perform a test on them. Is that right? Marcia? Yes, yes, that's true. And then you will follow these people up to see whether the findings of your test correlate with their future outcome. Yes, one to 10 years approximately. So this is a type of a cohort study. It's not a typical cohort study. In typical cohort study, all the people included at the beginning have the same characteristics. But because you are following people up in time, your healthy controls are not defined by presence or absence of disease. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a special type of a cohort study where some people can call it also a hybrid design, or well, there are many names can be given to it, but the main feature is you identify people, you give them an intervention, you follow them up over time to see what is their outcome. And as, as soon as you get element of follow up in a study, it becomes like a cohort study. Okay, I turn now, Nina, you have, uh, You have patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and um, you have two methods of catheter ablation, and then you want to compare clinical parameters Well, that's a well-defined question. Um, I don't have any specific comment other than to say when you say you will make comparison according to clinical parameters, I think you need to define what those parameters will be. And as soon as you can define them, then you need to think about how they will be met. Because now I move to Mitya. Mitya. Prognostic accuracy of different tests in detection of lung cancer. Now, tomorrow we will talk in more detail about accuracy of tests. But what you'll highlight here, prognostic accuracy, predictive model. Remember, predictive model is a statistical analytic methods. Predictive model is not an intervention. Or in this case, is it an intervention? Uh, Mitya, can you clarify that? Maybe you can unmute your mic and clarify that? Yes, I will try. <laughs> uh, because I'm not sure um, how to, you know, how to get into uh, the strategy in the correct way. Uh, mm -hmm. My planned study will, um, will involve lung cancer patients. Um, and I will try to develop a machine learning algorithm uh to predict um the probability that these patients will uh will uh, indeed get uh, the lung cancer in let's say uh, a couple of years yeah from uh, from the point where when this um, algorithm will be tested okay just once one one sec before you go uh the people who you will test will be those with known lung cancer or will be just people with risk factors? No, it will be people with existing, it will be a retrospective study. So all the data are already existing, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the hospital database. Uh, I will choose um, all available lung cancer 
patients uh, okay. in this hospital. So I, I think it will be around 5,000 patients with different uh, tests performed. Yeah, the lung function tests, uh, uh, blood tests, uh, uh, medical history, and uh, some vital signs. Um, and the con con control uh, group, for uh, which is also important for the development of this machine learning algorithm, will be composed of uh, healthy uh, matched controls. Yeah, uh, okay. I will so, try look, to match them in as much uh, factors as possible. Okay, so basically, your outcome of the prediction hmm? using machine learning. Yes. Will be how accurate the model was. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the model we will just say um, uh, yes or no. It will have a binary outcome. Yeah. It will say, uh, does this patient uh, have a probability that uh, he will develop lung cancer in the, the covered time, time frame? Okay. And that will be the result, main result of your thesis. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So basically, yours is a study where you will determine the accuracy of a prediction model using this control design. Uh, I'm not sure. Is this a case control design? That was but you, look. Oh. You, dis you decided to choose people with known diagnosis. They, this is a case, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the outcome is already known in this situation. Mm -hmm. Then you decided to identify healthy controls. Who are your controls? Yes. You went back in time to discover information about them. Yes. So this is a classical case control design. You are going back in time to check what happened to them in the past. And your statistical analysis involves machine learning. Yes, but uh, in the reality, I, I will have both. Uh, I will have information about the out outcome and I will also have information about their initial uh, exposure. Yeah, this exposure will will just mean uh, this in results of different investigations. Well, I'd just like you to hold on one second. Mm -hmm. The initial exposure will have been determined after the knowledge of the fact that they have lung cancer, right? Oh. Hmm. You will travel well, back really, in time because after the knowing you will travel back in time after knowing who has lung cancer. Yes, but also I will have a population who has lung cancer and uh, part of population doesn't have is healthy population. Yeah. Well, this but, is a classical case control design. Okay. I just I just take you to to the slide I showed yesterday and let's see how what you propose just now is different to what I showed yesterday. Now, it may be possible that your supervisor doesn't like to call this case control design because it does not look, excuse the use of the term, sexy enough, right? This is what we studied yesterday. You start with outcome, lung cancer, control mm -hmm. without lung cancer, you go back in time to see what were their exposures. And then you just apply machine learning over here when you have all of this information available. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. But uh, I'm bothered with the fact that uh, I already, I also know what were the exposures. I will just... Uh... In every case control study, you know what were the exposures because you go back in time to find them out. Mm -hmm. Because if you cannot know the exposure, you cannot apply your machine learning model. Yes. Okay. So, so it is a case control design. Okay. Now this is. I'm bothered because it's not a classical clinical study. It's it combines this uh, machine learning part, and so it's difficult for me to uh, to interpret it. <laughs> what? 
if you are if you are asking me to comment on what you told me mm -hmm. the machine learning part is only applied at this time when you calculate the effect size right at the bottom mm -hmm. the machine learning part is simply a statistical technique applied to a case control study there is nothing special about machine learning other than the fact that it uses a computer that can keep on working all night when you and your supervisor are sleeping and in the morning it can give you the statistical output mm -hmm. or is there something more smart about it than what i said no it, it put this way um, i think yes i think you're right <laughs> okay thank you for agreeing with me <laughs> right <laughs> let's uh, look, my job is to simplify things. Maybe it is too simplified. But please try to understand. Once you understand it in a simple way, you then have the possibility to add layers of complexity to the basic understanding. Mm -hmm. So please don't become confused by the fact that there is machine learning. Machine learning is simply a method of statistical analysis. There's nothing more fancy about machine learning than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, I do not say that machine learning is simple. People spend their whole life learning about how machine learning works. So clearly there is more to it than what I said in a few words just now. But that does not take away the fact that it is applying this sophisticated statistical method to a classical case control design. Mm -hmm. We move on to another colleague, if I miss. Uh, Polona, you are next, is that right, in the list of topics described? Uh, um, your question is timing of, what is ARM? It's anorectal malformation. All right, we it talked is, about that yesterday yes, as well. But I changed the question a bit to make it Very a good. case control study. I think this yeah. is mm -hmm. a bit better. Yeah. Patient, patients. Um, so patients who are operated are your patients? Yes, the patients that are operated. Exposures, the exposures are uh, uh, operated patients, early or operated yeah. late? Right. Yeah. And the function. Am I right? Your exposures are operated early or operated late? Yes. And then your outcome is the bowel function. Yes. Well, that's a that's a very very clear question. The moment you know this, then you know this is, is a study that involves follow up. There is a cohort, and look when you have all this data. Well, I suppose you can apply machine learning here to determine what are the predictive factors that determine outcomes in these patients. The, what the statistics you apply are up to you and your supervisor. The, the method of analysis of the data is not limited by the question. Thank you. Jaka, Thank you. to your question. Okay, you want to make some comments about it if you're already on the on the on on the speaker. Um, my question is: Can bile acids be used as biomarkers for hepatocellular carcinoma? Okay, well, that's uh, so. In this study, will you have so you will also have healthy volunteers and those with carcinoma, and I presume you will go back in time to figure out whether they have bile uh, acids present in the past. Is that correct? No, the the objective is to collect blood samples and to, to compare the bile acid profile and to try to develop uh, biomarkers for uh, diagnosis. Fine. So in this Diag case, you may have collected the data on the biomarker at the same time when you determine the outcome. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In this case, it's more like a cross-sectional study where you don't have time follow-up involved, either forward in time or backward mm -hmm. in time. 
So it's but, a cross section of. That's correct. And then, and then you will determine the accuracy of whether the marker has a particular sensitivity or specificity. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is a classical. This we call a classical test accuracy study. It is a cross sectional study. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss this type of a design in more detail. And if you do, so so you are calling it a case control study. Case yeah, control yeah. study can be a design for a test accuracy evaluation. Uh, and uh, let's discuss I, I, this in more detail tomorrow. Okay. And and the same applies to uh, to uh, the question about use of machine learning. Let's discuss okay. this yeah. in more detail tomorrow. When you refer to prediction, you are normally including uh, the possibility of follow up in time. This changes the nature of the relationship between the test and the outcome. And again, this is a feature we will study in more detail tomorrow. When we look at evaluation of tests. OK, so shall we at this stage? I think we have covered everybody's. Uh, Katrina also has a question about uh, patients with pain. Intervention is uh, EMG. EMG, OK. Nerve, nerve studies. And the outcome is. Uh, well, what is the outcome? I don't understand what is the outcome. Um, so yes, can you, uh, hello, can you I, I, explain that that be that will be nice. I see now that I forgot to mention the outcome. The outcome would be the betterment of the symptoms. So um, um, I would design this study for three cohorts, like one would be just EMG test, one would be skin biopsy, and one would be uh, with patients who had bo both done. So uh, we would compare uh, which uh, therapies they received and how much um, their symptoms uh, got better. So how how um, how, mu how much less pain or paresthesia they are um, experiencing in the end. That would be the outcome. So perhaps you are trying to figure out if the knowledge of test helps the clinician give a better treatment. Is that correct? Yes, my main question would be, is the skin biopsy needed at all for um, diagnosing and treating the neuropathies or when is it needed, like um, in some special cases or uh, in all of the patients who have positive uh, symptoms? Okay, so I think... Uh, I think Okay. Could everybody check that their microphones are muted? To je per koma per tula remi. Tudi, ampak ne pogoste pa mače kras. Ado nekaj. Okay, so look, your design is a cohort design because you are following people up in time forward. Okay. Uh, depending on your question, what kind of analysis you construct? To determine the effect size mm -hmm. or determine the result of your question, of your analysis, will, will possibly be uh, influenced by exactly what is it that you wish to discover. Mm 